So basically my presentation is just on about three or four different sort of common tour releases I've seen with some of my players uh, as well as um, some players I've tested. Uh, as David said, you know, one of the things I think that's great about Hack Motion is just the ease of use. Like literally we had the Canadian Open at our place uh, last June. I slapped it on, I was able to slap it on a few players who were willing to, uh, to get some data for me uh, and it all took, you know, 10 seconds. So it's lovely, just get the calibration and go, it's very easy to use. So a couple things that I think are considerations when you look at maybe choosing a release model or perhaps seeing if, if that player is in a certain release model, okay? So number one, how does the player currently square the club face? Right, I think that's really an important thing to understand is at the wrist level, how is that player getting the club face back to square, okay? How is the player dealing with club head speed? As Brian alluded to, it has to go somewhere, okay? So I either have to be able to rotate my body really quickly, okay, or else at some point that club head's gonna move faster than the wrist segment, which is gonna move faster than my arm segment, which is gonna move faster than my body segments. So it has to go somewhere. Um, something I hope to get into a little bit is, is how do they deal with the club face vector? Because that vector, you know, is where's that face in space, okay? Where's that face? And that face has both a left and right component, but also a loft component. And unfortunately, with conversations, I don't like rate of closure at all, um, simply because it's not taken into consideration, the loft component. Does the player like to shape different shots, or do they create one shot shape the majority of the time? I think that's a big consideration on what they do at the hand and wrist level. Are they using path primarily to influence curvature and keeping the release style similar? or are they manipulating release styles to hit different windows and shot shapes, okay? Um, there's some cool data that uh, Guru took of uh, Mr. Trevino there, you know, with a negative, what, 19? Or almost 60 degrees of, of sort of flexion, uh, hitting some very low stingers. What is the player's common miss, okay? What is the club face vector doing through the bottom of the swing? Um, so this is a term I came up with eight years ago, club face vector deviation across an interval. And that made me, basically with the rate of closure conversations, a quick history was, because it didn't have the loft components, I wanted to know from, let's say, one foot before impact to one foot after impact, what was the club face vector doing? Okay, or where was that face actually going? And what is the shape of the vector's release? And we'll talk about that in a second. Also, there's equipment considerations, lie angle, bounce, camber. There's all sorts of different things on how that club enters the turf and, and what we do with it. And from a fitting perspective, I think there's some interesting uh, conversation we can have, being able to match up the wrist release style with the right bounce and, and, and so on. All right, so first off, we've got sort of a stable extension toward flexion model or I like to call it the swing guide sort of power package style. So you've got players like a Tommy Fleetwood or somebody like that. And this is what the graph kind of looks like. This is actually Thorbjorn Olsen's graph. Uh, he has a very similar sort of pattern. So as Brian alluded to, green flexion extension, blue radial ulnar deviation, purple is the global rotation. Um, so in this type of a pattern, this player is basically like the swing guide, keeping the amount of extension somewhat constant from a dress to the top of the swing. Halfway down, they get this little bit of flexion into the golf ball, okay? Call that your old school turn down release, okay? Um, very much like your pattern there. From there, uh, there's generally, because we have club head speed, we're gonna see that rotate a little bit more. So generally the rotation values in this pattern are higher than the second one I'm gonna show you, okay? So this old style release, uh, produces some interesting things. It generally produces a little bit longer flat point, which is kind of cool. You can kind of measure this a bit with your hack motion. Is how, how long does that club kind of stay against the ground somewhat? If this isn't going back into radial deviation quickly, that wrist is staying somewhat <coughs> in that plane for a little bit of time, okay? Also, we see that the amount going back into flexion isn't rapidly going into flexion. I'm sorry, into extension, my apologies. Vince. Basically a long, yeah, you call that longer divot, you know, you might call it longer divot, longer flat spot at the bottom. Um, this type of swing is releasing the speed 
more through the rotation. So that could be rotation from the body, could be some supination as well. Um, but generally the values are much higher. Generally the, the curve on the rotation graph is much steeper. Okay. Obviously Tommy Fleetwood hits it pretty good. I'd love to get his data, but that, you know, he practiced a lot with power package and swing guide to sort of maintain that sort of, we'll call that in plane or in lead arm type of a golf swing. So, as I said, kind of old school release, Thorbjorn, Tommy Fleetwood, you can train it with the swing guide. Um, <coughs> we have to be very careful that we don't over, overload radial deviation. So one of the things is as you radially deviate, if everybody takes a wrist and does this, radial deviate, there comes a point where you can't go any further. As you hit that point, your wrist will want to go into extension. Okay? Because I can increase this more if I extend the wrist. So, as a result, if I overload this, so going back to that other graph, in Thorbjorn's case, you won't see a lot of radial deviation. Call this your Steve Stricker, call this a slightly underloaded, I call it underloaded constant radius pattern. Uh, but basically, not a lot of sort of buggy whipping in play in the radial plane. This is sort of your Steve Stricker back and through kind of motion like this. So most of this is coming through rotation. Interestingly enough, when you look at the club face vector, and I won't probably have time to do this, but if somebody wants to see this in the hall, I'll show them. The club face vector has more loft and right bias entering the impact interval and less loft exiting than the other release styles. So basically that club face is pointed higher and to the right, and as that player learns to sort of turn this down, they're turning that vector down a little bit at impact. So technically Johnny Miller was right when he said there's such a thing as a turn down draw. That type of release pattern is taking the vector from high right and moving it along. I've got my laser I can show somebody after. Um, generally a release pattern seen in push draw players because a player that has that vector going high and right, if I swing right enough I can hit these pretty little high draws like a Tommy Fleetwood. Okay? My miss though tends to be high block right and lower left. Okay? Most of the pros in the room probably have seen that once or twice. Okay? So very common. The next model we see is sort of a flexion to extension model, or what I call Cobra pattern. So Cobra pattern, uh, Victor Hovland would be a good example of this. Uh, one of my NCAA players here, um, Johnny Trevally, uh, definitely exhibits this. So this is a little different. We'll call this a little bit more of a new school release pattern. And it kind of looks completely backward. And this is the value of why the hack motion is so important, okay? Because if I try and teach Johnny to hit shots, different shots, by using the first wrist pattern, and this tends to be his sort of signature release. So we look at this, this is a lot different. Halfway back, he's pushing his wrist into flexion quite a bit. And then prior to impact, he's letting some of it out. Now, he still is fairly flat, like Brian was saying earlier, he's, he's not technically scooped into extension at impact, but he's definitely releasing it toward extension. Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing. So going back to a, a couple patterns there, we saw this one, and we talked about the rotation, and, and we saw how that, like Brian alluded to, is kind of going through the zero mark. So basically, wherever that sensor started, this player kind of brings that sensor roughly back to that position at impact. Okay. Now, you go forward a couple frames, you go back to this one, look at the difference in the purple. So Johnny Trevally is holding his left form 50 degrees more open at impact than it was at setup. He's squaring up the face by allowing his wrist, which is an extension, or sorry, inflection, to go toward extension. Okay? So he is absolutely scooping this thing, technically. Okay, so DJ, Hovland, Kepka, Trevally. Okay, flexion keeps out the excessive radial. Remember I said if you extend your wrist a ton, okay, eventually, sorry, if you radial deviate a ton, it's going to go to extension eventually. In this case, if I actually build enough flexion, it actually pushes the wrist more toward ulnar deviation. So in today's golfing world, why is that of value? Okay. Mostly the golf ball. 
Right? Golf ball doesn't spin like the old ball. So to get the ball airborne, generally we need a little bit wider, shallower, a little bit more dynamic loft at impact. So if I have a little bit of ulnar deviation, I'm sort of widening out the bottom of that swing arc a little bit. Okay? And you'll see that more and more, I think, as time goes by. You can put Colin Morikawa in that category as well. A lot of very good ball strikers with that type of pattern. The club face vector actually has less loft and a very slight right bias entering the impact area and more loft exiting. Right? So if you took your wrist and you scooped it, you'd see, okay, less loft to more loft. So what happens is the vector, as that goes uh, and, uh, through impact, is on a totally different shape. It's actually going from low right to high left. The other pattern was actually going from high right to mid-low left. To the mid -low left. Right, very interesting. Generally, you'll see players who hit pull fades like this. Okay? Johnny's a pull fade player, uh, very slight, very straight hitter. Each of these guys kind of is in that ballpark to a certain extent. Misses tend to be lower to mid-right miss and a higher left miss than option A. So this is a player that doesn't hit a lot of snap hooks. Okay? This is a player that hits pulls when they miss it left. So those pulls are up in the air because their wrist is going this way. Option A, when they hit left, watch out, right? They're in the weeds on the left. Is it, is it my imagination that their divot depth reflects, reflecting their... It could. That's what I was saying in, in the first slide about equipment considerations. These players generally need more bounds, for sure, right? Maybe to stop that from going too deep, okay? Uh, definitely wedge play. There's some interesting things you can talk about with their wedge play. A player that, like Tommy Fleetwood, can probably use a, you know... Very, very shallow one with, without a lot of bounds. Okay. I mean, these guys are divot takers. Correct. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, this is just throwing my opinion out there a little bit, but I think that this pattern is really great for long clubs because your start line vector stays closer to the target. There's more change in the vertical component, less change in the left and right component. Okay. However, consistency in wedge plays, like you were saying, Craig, was might be different loft amounts, might be more difficult to hit different distances. Okay. Option C, so Richard here is uh, one of my players, plays um, in Japan. Uh, right, right now he's 300th in the world, uh, about 185 ball speed. Um, this swing right here, he hit at 330 with a three wood. Okay, really, really hits it hard. Um, this would be wrist option C. <coughs> So wrist option C, what I call sort of a long hitter's radial down cock pattern. This is a little different because what we see is an increase in the radial halfway down. So this is your lagger, okay? This is somebody that likes to create speed by lagging this, okay, a lot. And then they're going to go ulnar very, very, very rapidly. So the interesting thing is the steepness and the lateness on this graph, to a certain extent, it's club bed speed. So the longer that line, the steeper that line is. That thing is coming out incredibly rapidly. Okay? Now, one thing that you have to be very, very careful, and this is the point with this arrow here, is if you've got a player that likes to down cock, you need to understand what they are doing in the um, extension and flexion capacity. Most players, as they increase radial, are going to go toward extension. Now, you notice what he's done. He actually goes slightly toward flexion as he's increasing radial. That's actually really, really hard to do. Okay? We've talked about his wrist. Um, to be honest with you, he, he's, he's such a good ball striker, I'm not going to touch it. Okay? Because he likes hitting different shots, different trajectories, and he's really, really good. So we've played around a little bit, but I probably won't change what he does. Uh, definitely when he strikes it poorly, this goes slightly into extension. Now he has to do something around impact. Because this player has so much speed, what we see, now this is a driver, so that was a driver swing, but when we went back to Tommy Fleetwood style, we saw this very sort of long flat spot. Okay? So this player, to a certain extent, is, is using their pivot to drive that club through, there's not a lot of change. Okay? Most of our club golfers will never be able to produce this because they can't move their pivots fast enough. Okay? So their wrist will blow up okay, because they can't pivot fast enough. 
When you're talking about somebody like Richard, who's got so much speed here, okay, that speed has to go somewhere. So in his case, it actually pops back into radial, pops into extension. Not a ton of rotation. But you got to remember, that club's entering that impact area very rapidly. It's going to go somewhere. Okay? In his case, you see less of a flat spot. So what does that mean? That means that Richard's timing has to be very, very good. Okay? When he has bad days, it's more because maybe he moves around a little too much. His structure changes a little bit. Now the timing of these things at impact slightly is off. Those are the days he's not going to hit the ball quite as well. Generally, and you saw that swing, I mean, he's got an absolutely lovely golf swing. Okay. But, I mean, he has to keep that sort of rhythm very, very consistent. Okay. He's got so much speed, he has to manage that well. So it's interesting working with him. It's, it's a very unique study. When you start to look at what goes on, another player I think would classify in this would be like a Robert Garrigus. Okay, very similar. Okay, a lot of down cock, but actually a lot of flexion at the same time. Obviously smashes the ball. So we're increasing radial while moving into flexion simultaneous is a difficult movement. These players tend to have more of a set at the top of their swing. So you saw Richard kind of get there and kind of just set it, kind of ease it down, and go ahead and add the speed at the bottom. So this type of a player, if they ever get quick in transition, is probably going to struggle. Club face vector has medium loft, a medium right bias entering the impact interval, and it has a little bit more loft exiting than option A. Okay, again, you, you, that face vector has to go somewhere. Exits will have more movement toward extension rotation radial due to the higher overtaking rates. Um, as I said, lots of angular speed into impact means it needs to release somewhere. These players, I find, tend to hit stingers really well. Right, a player that likes to down cock it, likes to hit those trappy little missiles very well, um, likes to hit different trajectories, different shot shapes. I said Richard, very, very good player. Okay. I had three, now I got four. I tested uh, Mackenzie Hughes, he was home for Christmas. We did a day of work um, while he was home, and that's actually the hack motion on his wrist there. And this is kind of his pattern. And I call this a little bit of a hybrid because this was a little bit different. This is a little bit in between A and B. And understanding a little bit of, of what McKenzie does with his, his grip primarily is the reason for this. So he has a very stable but slightly descending toward flexion uh, amount. As David uh, said uh, in the last segment, I deal a lot with the graphs. I really don't look at these at all. I want to know how much it changes. But due to the calibration, I don't really care if it started at 60 or started at 30 or whatever. I want to know how much. I think tour average in the flexion extension on your top players is generally about 30 degrees or so change. About that. Okay. So I look for how much is this changing max and min values more than I do ab, you know, what the actual absolute value is. But you see that he's very, very stable, goes toward flexion. But right before impact, he does let out some of that flexion. Okay. Now he has to because I've taught him since he was 15 years old. He's got a four knuckle left hand grip that he will not change. You know, very you know, 15 years ago when we started together, that was one thing that was just non-negotiable. So he gets this thing slightly extended at the top of his backswing. He puts it flattish on the way down. At impact, he's actually hitting it slightly in extension because of that grip. Okay. He's holding that form, if you will, open about 10 degrees, and that squaring up is a little bit of this, just like Johnny Trevally. Rotation values are somewhere in between kind of the two models, if you will. Okay. So interesting that there's sort of a hybrid model. Um, I'm sure, as I said, we could go through everybody's and, and see different traits, but these are common models that I see uh, with my players. So... I would call this a bit of a transitional model for him because in his old pattern, when he struggles with his ball striking, his lead wrist does go into extension in transition. So the last, you know, sort of five or six years, anytime we've done some work together, we're always trying to underload him, get rid of the radial because radial messes him up. Okay? I would say for most players in this room, good players, 
get rid of this and you're going to make a lot better golfers. Okay? Most players cannot time this particularly well. So get rid of it. That shallows out the sweet spot a little bit, but it also allows him to turn his pivot. He's actually three miles an hour faster when he underloads it. Okay? And the reason is when it's underloaded, sweet spot's already in the right place, he just pivots really, really hard, really fast. Okay? If he overloads this, he has to stall his pivot to get rid of it. To get rid of it. So he's actually slower when he does that. So, lag is not always a good thing. Mackenzie, on the other hand, whereas Richard likes to hit a lot of different shots, Mackenzie likes to hit it one way pretty much all the time. He likes the same trajectory, same little cut. As long as he has that, he feels like he can go out there and play. He doesn't move it around a whole lot. <coughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. First off, thank you. This is very, very well organized, very well done, very thank you. informed. It's a lot of work goes into that. So when you're when you're putting the motion on and, and looking at full swing, you're taking the graph pattern, yes, disseminating it, and then attempting to make as little change as you have to get the desired ball flight you're looking for? That would be, yeah, exactly. Very minimalistic if I can. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that excited me a lot about Hack Motion when I first got involved a little bit with them, um, Christoph in um, Austria, Bosak? Yeah. Bosak, Christoph Bosak in Austria uh, showed this to me back, I guess, in the spring when I was over in Europe uh, doing some of my class, uh, certifications. And what I liked was the ease of use, but also how when I strap this on my own swing, I purposely tried to swing it six different ways. Okay? At the wrist level, when I hit a bad shot, it was exactly the same. So think about that for a second. I purposely was trying to swing it six different ways, but when I hit a bad shot, the same error at the wrist level was there. So maybe I shouldn't be working on new swings, I should be working on the wrist angles. So that kind of blew my mind a little bit. So when I started to test with it and, and do some things with it, to answer your question, what I wanted to do was a good player that came to me, I wanted to understand exactly what they were doing. Whether it was quote, quote, good or bad, I needed to understand how are they scoring the face, how are they dealing with club head speed, right? And what is their miss, and then what do they, most importantly with a tour player, what they don't want to miss it, right? Because that's often what we're, we're doing is trying to work them away from that. Um, but if I can, I'm going to be very minimalistic, maybe quiet things down, but not necessarily flat out change it. Okay. The interesting thing was how different wrist option A was, your swing guide, Tommy Fleetwood, to your modern sort of Cobra pattern or you know, DJ pattern, if you will, and how much different that was. Because at impact, that wrist is doing something completely opposite. Instead of moving toward flexion, Cobra pattern is actually moving toward extension. I mean, 180 degree opposite. So how they would hit shots, how they would hit chip shots, how they would, all those things would change. So you take the existing wrist pattern, which in their case, especially at that level, mm -hmm. is going to that. It's kind of their signature. Right. I think it's best to probably maybe modify it marginally, but not change it. And work with that signature. Yeah, and, and have them understand, you know, when your ball does this, this is probably what happened, come up with some drills, et cetera, to maybe change that or manage that. And I think that's the best thing. With a tour player, really good players, this device is beautiful to manage their swing. Because now I know what they're doing. If they're hitting it badly, I can strap it on there very quickly, disseminate what they're doing differently. Okay, because you're going to see it there at the wrist level. How about this? Do, you have a tour, do the tour players, or do you have tour players using this on their own and sending you data? I try not to. I don't trust, no, just, I mean, just a little bit, you know, it, it's kind of, too much information sometimes for those guys is, is very dangerous. Somebody you've been working with for a while, and they're on the phone, and you have a pretty good handle on it. Well, that's the nice thing. They can screenshot it. I can compare it, do some things. Uh, we can send it back and forth. I mean, it's very, very easy on that end. As you know, as I'm a little bit like David. I don't actually use the tiles much. I don't use the animation much. Although I will do that with some of our beginning players, and maybe so they understand some of these complexities of the wrist. I'll show them the 3D animations, but... For the most part, I deal just with the graphs. Thank you. What's their general appreciation of the information? Are they like, holy cow? I just don't tell them. Ah. You know, I just don't tell them. Um, maybe explain to them why they're missed a certain way. 
uh, a little bit, maybe understand, like, like I kind of like the idea of saying, hey, if I tighten up these wrist movements a little bit, reduce the degrees of freedom, then most definitely we're going to see a tightening of your, your dispersion patterns. And do they appreciate it, uh, sort of the conversation of economy and movement? Uh, yeah, yeah, for the most part. I mean, they're all sort of schooled to say, hey, you know, I want less moving parts and I want to be more repeatable and, and all the rest of that stuff. You can kind of sell that a little bit with that. Any other questions? With uh, <coughs> regular golfers, yes? um, what do you do to change the body movement and then check how the, uh, the wrist works or start? Great question. I, I, think, I think I would actually go the other way. I think with beginning players, I would go old school, have them understand how to use these a little bit. Um, then build the body movements around that that support that. Again, obviously, we, we're talking about players coming to you at different levels. Your raw beginner really has no clue on what their hands are supposed to do, so it might take them, you know, to make smaller swings, focusing on one of those release styles. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a chicken or the egg scenario, though. I think. I mean, obviously, the body supports the wrists, and the, but the wrist movements will also support the body movements and what you do with them. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, if I've got a new player I'm working with, I'll do a little bit of sort of archiving, at least from the start. What are they doing when they come to see me that first time? But generally, I, I don't use video a ton. I don't use um, TrackMan a whole lot uh, until I'm pretty happy with the way they're hitting it. Right? Then I'll archive. These are their numbers. Uh, at that point, then I'll test them. Uh, a little bit more thoroughly on, on uh, whether I've got a couple KVS if I'm looking at body movements, or but definitely the wrist stuff. Um, the nice thing about this is is we can keep this in the bag and you know, even warm up with it if you really had to and just kind of look at patterns. I, I think I haven't done enough in that area to do it, but I definitely do it the same way. Yes. Have you used the biofeedback and all of the setting? Them? Yeah, I mean that, nobody's talked about that yet really, but the biofeedback's great if you're if you're talking about sort of even let's say in the flexion extension range, you've got somebody to say, okay, let's create a, a 40 degree window that they can move within, but that's it. And set a you know, minimum and a maximum value there and just have them make those swings and, and hopefully without hearing the tones, right? Um, they know that they're sort of minimizing some of those movements. I've seen a lot of good things with that to sort of quiet up some of the, uh, especially in transitional movement. That's where things tend to go a little haywire. Hey, that's great. Okay. That's really Thank you. Thank you. golf product here called the hack motion wrist sensor. The beauty of getting the proper wrist angles in the golf swing is once you get them, the body starts to fall behind and do the right thing. You can have feedback on every single swing and makes your learning speed That's what we'll do the wrist. From a golf coach point of view, if you can get something that gives you feedback and makes you improve all the time, that's delightful for practice. The hack motion wrist sensor can help you learn to do this better than any device I've ever seen in 35 years of teaching. For user interface simplicity and price, this is unmatched. A great product from Hack Motion. If you get your hands on one of these and you have a club face issue or a wrist issue at the top, this will tune you up really thick. Very sensitive piece of equipment here. Get one today.